Okay, so yeah, thanks again for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And so today I wanted to tell you about some recent work that we've done connecting uh, the physics of topological defects with the formation of fruiting bodies in bacterial colonies. And so this is work that I've done at the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science at Princeton. And uh, I wanted to um, start by giving you an overview of um, collective biological phenomena uh, happening at very different scales. And so what you see here is three movies. On the left, you see a single cell that is migrating on a substrate. And this is a collective phenomenon because cell motion is driven by the collective action of the intracellular components. And this happens over scales of say tens of microns. What you see in the center is another collective phenomenon in which many, many cells migrate collectively on a substrate and therefore they spread um, this tissue cohesively. Um, and then finally, what you see on the right is the collective motion of sheep um, in this flocking-like motion. And so this is yet another example of a collective biological behavior um, at a much larger scale over, over a scale of say up to tens of meters. And so one question, at least from the physics perspective, is whether despite the enormous differences between all of these biological systems and behaviors, there are any organizing principles that can help us understand what's common between them. And so one possible answer to that is that in fact, um, all these different systems are part of what we call active matter in the sense that they are internally driven, their own components are able to move on their own. And as a result, they exhibit these spontaneous flows uh, and these fluids can flow even without having to apply external forces to them. And so what I want to tell you about today is an example of how the physics of active matter is important for the biological function of a specific system, which is a, a type of bacterial colony. And so this work was actually a collaboration between theory and experiments. And so the experiments were done by Katie Copenhagen, who's a postdoc in, in the lab of Josh Shavitz at Princeton. And I did the theory together with Matt Wingreen also at Princeton. And so again, to introduce this topic of uh, bacterial colonies, I want to show you a movie of two bacterial colonies. What you see on the left is a colony of a soil bacterium known as Myxococcus santus, uh, which I will refer to simply as Myxo from now on. And so what these Myxobacteria are doing is they are spreading collectively on the substrate, as you can see, and they are in particular migrating over the colony on the right, which is a colony of E. coli. And what's happening here is actually an act of mass massacre because the, um, the Myxo cells are actually eating the E. coli cells as they go. They are preying on them. And in doing so, they form a number of collective behaviors, such as the ripples here on the right-hand side and um, the, the mix of cells that are left behind without access to the E. coli, without food, they form this aggregate of cells uh, that look like spots, like black spots, okay? So this is precisely what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on the emergence of these black spots. And so the first thing that I want to show you is that they are not actually spots, but they are three-dimensional cell aggregates that look like this. They look like little droplets, each of which contains hundreds of thousands of these bacteria. And these uh, aggregate droplet-like aggregates of cells uh, are known as fruiting bodies. And so they are in fact part of the collective life cycle of this social um, soil bacteria. And so let me tell you about this uh, collective life cycle first, and, and then I'll move on to how uh, these fruiting bodies emerge. And so imagine that you get a few spores of Myxococcus, um, these spores are spherical cells that are metabolically inactive so that they can resist long periods of time without food, okay? They are able to survive starvation. Now, imagine that you take these spores and you give them a little bit of food. What they will do is they will undergo a process known as germination, whereby they transform from spheres into rod-shaped cells. And these rod-shaped cells are now metabolically active and they behave collectively and they prey on other bacteria exactly as I was showing uh, in the first movie that I showed, okay? So this was what, what's known as the swarming phase. Now, the interesting thing is that when uh, these bacteria run out of food and they start starving, then they will aggregate into dense two-dimensional colonies. And from these dense two-dimensional aggregates, they will form these massive three-dimensional structures known as fruiting bodies. And the key thing is that now inside these fruiting bodies, uh, the rod shaped bacteria will transform back into spores and this will allow them to resist the starvation, okay? And so this completes the cycle and all this life cycle is, um, you know, performed in the collective ways. A single bacterium wouldn't do any of that. 
And what I want to focus on today is precisely this transition between two-dimensional cell aggregates and then three-dimensional fruiting bodies. And so what was known about this transition is that the way that these bacteria build fruiting bodies is actually one layer at a time. And so here's a movie that shows that. Uh, what you can see is a cell colony with, with initially two cell layers. And as time goes on and these bacteria starve, you will eventually see that the third layer of cells appears here and then at many different points in the system. And as time goes on, even a fourth layer appears and then a fifth layer appears. And so more and more layers are being added sequentially, one on top of the other, until eventually the bacteria come all together into this massive three-dimensional mound that will become fruiting bodies. And so when we saw movies like this, what we wondered is how did this bacteria manage to form a new cell layer in the first place? That's not obvious because if you think about it, these bacteria are not growing. They are starving, so they're not growing. The only thing that they're doing is they are very well attached to the substrate and they migrate on it. So how do they manage to build up the stresses to build up a new, you know, a new cell layer on top of one another? And so to address this question, our experimental colleagues took very high resolution images of a single cell layer. And so this looks like this. What you see here is the individual cells that are rod shaped, as I said, and because of the rod shaped and the, the high density at which they're packed, they align with one another. The cells align with one another. And so they form a phase of matter um, with orientational order. So this is what we know in physics as a liquid crystal, right? But this is an, what we call an active liquid crystal because the cells are not just subject to random thermal fluctuations, but they actually actively migrate on the underlying substrate. And so this colony is able to flow on its own uh, because of this active driving of each individual cell. Now, uh, what I should say here too, is that um, these cells actually reverse their direction of motion every few minutes. And so at any point in time, half of the cells are moving one way, but the other half of the cells are moving in the opposite direction. And so this means that there's a, an axis of alignment, but there's no net direction of motion. There's no left or right. Um, and so uh, the other thing that I want to say is that as in any liquid crystal, um, these bacteria um, also feature, these bacterial colonies also feature particular points known as topological defects where the cell alignment is locally lost, okay? And so from now on, what I will do is to focus on this topological defect. And so the first thing that I will show you Ricard, is- uh, Yeah. Uh, just quickly, just to let you know, it's a little bit hard to see the movies. So in case that makes it m more pointing and things like that might help for us to understand uh, the movies, but just to let you know. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'll move on and, and I'll use the pointer in, in the following movies. Um, so the, what I want to show you now is actually uh, a quantification of the cell alignment in the cell colony. And so here's a, a map of the angle field, the angle at which cells are aligned at each point in space. And so this psychedelic map shows you, shows you that um, cell alignment varies smoothly throughout the colony, except at a few points. And so I'm gonna try to point at them. Uh, there's a couple of these points here, one here, one here, one here, where all of the colors meet. Right. There's also one here. There are two more here down in the image, uh, one more here, etc. The image contains a few of these points where all of the colors meet. And this means that at these points, the axis of cell alignment is not well defined. I cannot just pick a single direction of cell alignment at these points. And so these are exactly singularities of the angle field. And this is precisely what's known as topological defects. OK, so this is what I want to focus on. So the next thing that I'll do is to show you that at these points, uh, cell alignment is locally lost. And so this is a map of the cell alignment field. This quantity S is one for perfectly aligned cells and drops down to zero when there's no alignment. And so you can see that most of the colony has cells that are perfectly aligned with one another, but then there are these specific points, uh, which are the topological defects, where the alignment locally drops down to zero. And so this is how we identify these defects. And what I want to show you now is how a pair of these defects, this particular pair of defects looks like. And so let me show you that. Um, here's a local map, you know, a, a close up view of this pair of defects. So you can see the individual cells. Again, the color code stands for the axis along which cells are aligned locally. And what you can see is that there are the, there's this point here, there's this one topological defect on the left, and there's this other topological defect on the right. And so what I want to show you now is that these two defects are actually different from one another. 
If we look at the defect on the left, the cells are arranged in a way that they are bending around the core on the left-hand side, and they are splayed on the right-hand side of the core of the defect, okay? And a structure like this has a single axis of symmetry, which is the horizontal axis in this image. Now, instead, if we look at the defect on the right, um, it has a very different arrangement of cells around it. Instead of having a single, a single axis of symmetry, it has three axes of symmetry, right? You can see that from this image. So if we rotate this image by 120 degrees, we would get exactly the same cell arrangement. And so a way to quantify the difference between these two topological defects is by looking at the quantity known as the topological charge, which is nothing else but the winding number of the cell axis of alignment as we move in a closed loop around the defect core, okay? So if we count, um, you know, if we follow the cell alignment as we move around the defect core and we count by how much it turns, we would find that for a defect like this, it makes half a turn. So the topological charge of this defect is plus one half. Whereas for defects on the right-hand side, if we do the same counting, um, it also makes half a turn, but in the opposite direction. Um, and so this, the topological charge of these defects is minus one half. Now, the way I will denote this, in, this um, defect in images is by placing a red dot at the core of the plus one half defects and then a segment along their single axis of symmetry. Whereas for the minus one half defects, I will use a blue dot and then three segments along their three axes of symmetry, okay? So then what we did was to um, identify and track these defects in the cell colony and see what they do. And so here's a movie that shows that. Um, what you can see is that uh, there are pairs of plus and minus one half defects that appear spontaneously in pairs. Then they generally move with the flows of cells and eventually pairs of plus and minus one half defects also annihilate. And so uh, the additional piece of information that you see in movies like this is um, the color map, which stands for the height field in the cell colony. So darker regions here mean that these regions are taller and this allows us to visualize new cell layers. This allows us to visualize where the cell layers are and how they form and so on. And so by looking at movies like this, what we eventually realized is that in some cases, the new cell layer uh, forms right at the position of a topological defect. And in particular, right at the position of one of the red topological defects, the plus one half topological defects. Instead, uh, when we look at the formation of holes, like the ones that you see here on the top right corner, we saw that they tend to form at the positions of the blue defects, the minus one half defects. So let me show you examples of that. Here's an example of a plus one half topological defect. And you can see that in a matter of just a few minutes, there's a new cell layer that forms right at the position of this plus one half defect, okay? And this is very clearly seen in the measured height field. Now, instead, if we look at the minus one half defect like this one, what we see is that on the same time scale, on just a few minutes, there's a new hole in the cell monolayer that opens up right at the position of this defect. And again, this is very clearly seen in the, in the measured height field, okay? Now, of course, we wanted to know how general this association between layers and defects was. And so to do this, what we did was to compute the probability that a new cell layer or a new hole would form at a given distance from a defect, okay? And so these are the results. What we find is that for new cell layers, it's about 100 times more likely that they will appear at a plus one half defect than far away from the defect. The probability decays with this over just maybe 10 microns or so, okay? Now, for new holes, what we find is that it's about 100 times more likely that they will form at a minus one half defect than far away from the defect. Again, the probability decays with distance, okay? So the experimental data are showing us that um, new cell layers preferentially form at plus one half defects and that new holes tend to open up at minus one half defects. And so, of course, now what we wanted to do was to understand why. Um, how is that, you know, how is that happening? And so to do that, we uh, turned uh, to theory. And so um, what I did was to develop a theory by treating the cell colony as an active pneumatic liquid crystal. And so this theory is based on imposing a force balance between frictional forces proportional to the speed at which the cells move on top of the substrate. And then uh, these friction forces are balanced by um, active forces uh, that the cells generate as they migrate on the substrate. And so what I will do is to first discuss the intuition behind these active forces, 
and then I'll discuss the friction forces. So let's imagine that uh, we look at a region of the system in which cells are aligned along a given axis that I will denote as N. Okay. This quantity in the physics of liquid crystals is known as the director field. Now, because the cells are active, they are migrating um, back and forth all the time along this axis of alignment. They generate forces on neighboring cells. They push on neighboring cells, mainly along the axis of alignment. And so uh, the, the mathematical way of encoding these forces is by writing down a stress tensor that is very anisotropic, and it depends on the axis of alignment um, in, the way, in, a, in a way in which you know, this um, stress tensor is proportional to another tensor Q, which is known as the pneumatic order parameter tensor that we built directly by taking the tensor product of this axis of alignment N, okay? And in two dimensions, this axis of alignment N is just given in terms of the angle of alignment, okay? Now, the interesting thing is what happens when we slightly distort this perfect alignment that I drew. And so when we distort it like, like I just did now, uh, we can now wonder what happens in a region of the system like the one I just boxed, okay? And so in this case, what you can see is that in a, an element of the fluid like the one that I boxed, there's now more stress on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side, okay? There's, an, there's a difference in stress. And this difference in stress implies that there's a net force that pushes on this element of fluid and it will make it move toward the left, okay? And so the mathematical way of expressing this fact is by saying that if I take the divergence of the active stress tensor that I wrote, I will get the active forces that make the cells move, okay? So now uh, this is, this, you know, these are precisely the active forces that go into the force balance. Now what I want to do is to discuss the friction forces. And so for friction, what's important to bear in mind is that in a system of rod-shaped cells, it's much easier for these cells to be dragged along their long axis, like this, than perpendicular to their long axis, like that, okay? This is much harder. And so uh, to account for this fact, what we did was to say that the friction coefficient here is not just a scalar quantity, it's not just a number, but it's a matrix with uh, components that account for the isotropic part of the friction, but then also this term that depends directly on the pneumatic order parameter tensor Q that quantifies cell alignment. And so this means, you know, this parameter here in front is a way of quantifying the degree of friction and isotropy. It's a way of saying how much easier it is for cells to move along their long axis than perpendicular to it, okay? And so uh, what we then did is based on this model, we took the particular arrangement of cells around the topological defect, we worked out the active forces that this particular arrangement generates, and then we use the force balance to solve for the flow fields that the cells generate around the topological defect. And so let's look at these predictions. Um, here's a plus one half topological defect. And so the, um, the um, solid lines indicate the axis of alignment of cells. And so you can see that the axis of alignment is converging into the core of the defect. And as a result of this convergence, there's a net pushing force on the core of the defect that will make it move toward the left, okay? Just by using the same arguments that I just explained. And so uh, this is exactly what you see in the predicted flow field. You see that all the little arrows are pointing toward the left. And so a defect like this will indeed self-propel itself toward the left. Now, the interesting thing is what happens if we look at the speed at which cells move, which is what the color code shows. And so if you, if you look at the color code, what you can see is that cells are actually moving faster behind the defect core here on the right-hand side than in front of the defect core here on the left-hand side. And this asymmetry in the speed is actually a consequence of friction and isotropy. Cells move into the core of the defect parallel to their alignment. And so they can move in fast, but then they have to move out of the core of the defect perpendicular to their alignment. And so this is much harder and they have to move out slowly. And so this gives rise to this asymmetry in the speed. And so this means that cells become accumulated at the core of the defect. And eventually these accumulating cells have to be extruded to form a new cell layer, okay? So this very simple theory is actually able to explain the experimental observation that new cell layers tend to form at plus one half defects. So now, of course, we can do the same thing for minus one half defects, which are the blue symbols that had these three axes of symmetry. And so in this case, what the theory predicts is that there are three directions along which cells move out of the defect core at a high speed. And then there are three other directions in which cells move into the defect core, but at a slow speed, 
Okay, so again, there is an asymmetry in the speed. And so this asymmetry in this case leads to a net outflux of cells from minus one half defects. And so cells at this point will become depleted and eventually there will be a new hole in the cell monolayer that will open up due to this depletion, okay? And so in this case as well, the theory is able to predict why uh, we observe new cell holes preferentially form at minus one half defects, okay? Then once we had these predictions for the flow fields, we of course went back to our experimental colleagues and asked them to measure the flow fields in, in, in the experiments. And so Katie did that, she measured flow fields around topological defects. And after averaging many, many topological defects together, what she obtained is this, okay? Which essentially confirms the, the predictions that we had, that there is a net out influx of cells into plus one half defects due to this asymmetry in the, in the cell velocity. And that there's these three directions of outflux and then three other directions of slow influx uh, on minus one half defects. And so again, uh, this confirms the net outflux of cells um, from these points, which explains a uh, whole opening, okay? Now, we wanted to make the comparison more quantitative. And so what we did was to uh, measure um, or you know, fit the theory to um, the flow field along the axis of the defect. So along the x-axis in these images, okay? So let me uh, discuss what we should expect. Um, in this- Ricard, about three minutes. Okay, that's good. Um, so in plus one half defects, what we should expect is that uh, the velocity is pointing left. And so this will correspond to negative velocities, okay? And the velocity will be higher on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. Whereas for minus one half defects, the velocity points toward the right. So this will correspond to positive velocities. And, um, and the velocity will again be higher on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side, okay? So indeed, if we plot this, cut through the velocity field, uh, what we obtained is something like this. Uh, for minus one half defects, we have these two peaks. They are, the velocity is always positive and is higher on the right than on the left. And for, um, for the plus one half defects, the velocity is indeed negative. And again, it's higher on the right than on the left, okay? So then we used our model to fit this data. And so to do that, we fixed the value of the um, cell alignment away from defects, which as you see is very, very close to one. So this is something we measured in the experiments. And then we fitted three quantities, um, the size of the defect core, the activity of the cells that ultimately comes from its self-propulsion and uh, friction and isotropy. And so by fitting these quantities, we were able to fit the experimental data. And so what I want to highlight here is that the fit of um, the minus one half defect velocity field is pretty good. We were satisfied with that. And for the plus one half effects, it's okay, but it's not as good. And in particular, what I want to uh, show is that there's a qualitative difference between the data and the model here in front of the plus one half defect. And this is something that's very surprising because if you look at the theory, it predicts that the, the entire defect is moving toward the left. But if you'd look at the data, what we measure is a little bit of counterflow. Cells in front of the defect are actually moving to the right, whereas the entire defect is moving to the left. So there's a bit of counterflow. Cells in front of the defect are moving into the defect somehow, okay? So this is what we wanted to then explain as well using the model. And so to explain this counterflow, what we did was to say, uh, in the model so far, we had assumed that cells, as soon as they are compressed, they readily pop up and form a new cell layer. And we said, actually, maybe cells on the monolayer can be a little bit compressed, before popping up. So maybe they don't readily extrude. And so to account for these compression effects, what we did was to say that because the defect is moving to the left, it will compress cells here in front. And these cells here in front will build up pressure. And the pressure will be something like this. It will be higher you know, on the left-hand side. And so we will have a pressure gradient that pushes cells back, okay? So as a result of this pressure gradient, we will have this counterflow. Um, and so this we wrote in equations by saying that now, in addition to the friction and the active forces, we have pressure gradients where the pressure field depends on the cell density. And using this generalized model, we were then able to refit the data and show that, in fact, we are able to also explain the counterflow that we find in front of the defects. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. So let me just summarize by saying that what we have found 
is that very physical quantities like the orientational order of cells in this bacterial colony and the associated topological defects combined with the activity due to cell migration explains how this bacteria managed to form new cell layers right at topological defects. And so I think that this is an example in which the physics of active matter and topological phenomena are actually intimately linked to the biological function of the system, which is to form new cell layers to end up building these massive three-dimensional fruiting bodies that will help the colony collectively resist starvation. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say. And so thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ricard, for that fantastic talk. Um, we do have several questions in the chat. <clears throat> the first is from Max, is how do you account for uh, cell body flexibility and what would happen if mixocells were not so flexible or non-flexible at all? Yes, great question. So we don't explicitly account for cell flexibility because the model that we do is coarse grained, right? It's a continuum model that coarse grains, uh, you know, over features of single cells. It's a model that applies to supracellular scales. And so we didn't take that into account. And what I would say is that, you know, if we now make cells that are stiffer somehow, then the parameters of our continuum model would have to be tweaked. It would have to be adapted to that. But predicting how, you know, exactly the microscopic features of single cells uh, relate to the continuum scale parameters that we had is non-trivial. And we didn't do that. Okay, thank you. There's a, I think there's another question partially related by Sri Krishna. Um, in your model, I think you are assuming that all the rod-shaped bacteria have the same length and aspect, and aspect ratio. Is this the case in reality? Is there a way to incorporate variable lengths into your model? Excellent question too. And exactly the same answer. So we didn't model uh, single cell properties. We modeled only coarse grained features. And so exactly the same answer to the previous question. We could in principle develop a microscopic model accounting for a distribution of cell sizes. And then from that, try to coarse grain it to obtain the continuum description that we had. We didn't do that. And so it would be you know, a great thing to do in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Jing Chen. In the Q equals minus one half, the three branches are not all equivalent. Is that correct? Huh, that's an interesting question. So in principle, we think they are equivalent. Uh, of course, not in the way they interact with other defects, for example. So if you have a plus one half defect close to a minus one half defect, the orientation of the minus one half defect matters a lot. The relative orientation matters a lot for their interaction. But if you have an isolated minus one half defect, we don't think that the three axes are different from one another. Okay, I think we have time for one more question um, from Fereshta. Can you change the friction between bacteria and the substrate and how does it affect the topological defects? Yes, very good question. Uh, so indeed, uh, we can. Uh, our experimental colleagues can coat the substrate with different um, you know, types of uh, molecules. And depending on how you coat the substrate, the cells will adhere more or less to it. And so this will change the friction coefficient. And uh, we're now doing that. So I can't yet tell you what's going to happen, but we're working on that. And so hopefully soon I'll have something to say. <laughs>